On today's episode of Locked On 76ers, they escape a very close one in Brooklyn. Game three, 102-97, take a commanding 3 nothing lead. Boy, was it physical. They had to work for it. We'll break it all down. What stood out to us right here at Locked On 76ers? You are Locked On 76ers, your daily Philadelphia 76ers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome. You are locked on 76ers. I'm Devon Givens from 97.5, the Fanatic Radio in Philadelphia, alongside my co host and partner, Sixers beat writer for the Inquire.com, Keith Pompey, live from Brooklyn. Keith, what's happening, man? What's good, D? How you been, bro? Uh, doing all right, man. Doing all right. Hanging in there. And, you know, tough one. Tough one for the Sixers and the Nets on Thursday. So we need to break all that down, give our thoughts. Thanks for making Locked On 76ers your first listen every day. And remember, Locked On 76ers is free and available on all platforms, including right here on YouTube at Locked On 76ers. Well, Keith, it was <laughs> it was a physical one in Brooklyn right from the start basically as uh we'll get to that how things played out there james harden getting ejected and again tyrese maxey standing up and showing up once again when the sixers needed him most in the final three minutes of that fourth quarter to help secure the victory keith right away uh the 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 the, the dunk by nick claxton over joel and bead and bead somehow crumbles to the floor and as he does so nick claxton does the step over which, as we all know, as a sports person, that's kind of disrespectful uh, when you're there. But the retaliation from Joel Embiid, that was also kind of disrespectful. Uh, he was not ejected. Neither of them were. Uh, a flagrant one was assessed to Joel Embiid for kicking up towards Nick Claxton. Claxton received just a technical foul. All that stuff kind of offset as uh, Claxton took the free throw. The Nets got the ball. All of that. And uh, they just continued to go on and play. Uh, later on, Nick Claxton was ejected with eight minutes and 58 seconds to go in the fourth quarter because another strong finish over Joel Embiid. He flexed on him, showing his then immaturity again and getting himself inject, ejected from the game when the team needed him most in the fourth quarter. They could have used him down the stretch, man. But it was wild. It was physical in the building. You were there. Can you run us through it? Man, that was a crazy game. I mean... You know, it's funny. I had to ask Doc afterwards. I said, I know you played in the 80s and the 90s, but have you ever seen anything like that? And then he reminded me of when he played for the Knicks and seven players were ejected and he was one of them against the Phoenix Suns. But to me, <laughs> in modern era basketball, I have yet to see anything like that. Not even on television have I witnessed anything like that in the modern game because typically you see a fight and then guys, a lot of guys may get into it. But this thing was ongoing, different things back and forth. You know what I mean? And the whole time, the whole 48 minutes of the game, you were concerned about Joel B. Like, is he going to make it through this one? I mean, he was they, he was falling like a um, like a dial, man. Just boom, boom, like a rag <laughs> getting tossed around. But I haven't seen anything like this. But I will say this. This was a big win for the Sixers because of two reasons. Um, a, they're up 3-0. B, they were able to fight through some adversity. And we've been saying that they've been a resilient team all season. But to fight through this one and to see how Maxi responded in that fourth quarter, how he, like, carried them, um, he willed them to win, um, to me, that was a huge – this was a huge win that the Sixers could hang their hat on. No, no, no. Why do you why do you say that one? And, you know, knowing that they didn't play well, only 102 points uh, defensively, giving up 97 trail for a good portion of the game um, in the second half, specifically when the Nets came back and took over in the third quarter. Uh, what, what makes you look at this one and say that, you know, of course, this was a good win fighting through all that resiliency and stuff. What what was it about the game that you felt like, OK, you know, this is actually a good win for the 76ers? You know, I, I, because sometimes character is shown when when everything is when everything is going against you. 
Like, you know, James Harden was ejected. Joel Embiid had a horrible offensive game. Like, let's just be real. Like, defensively, he had some nice blocks, huge block at the end. But offensively, he did not look like the MVP. He just didn't. Um, you know, you, you uh, Tobias was missing some shots at times, but he played well, but he was missing some shots that he was typically making. But that environment was kind of hostile. And, and, I, and, you know, that was a question mark that we had going into the game. How would Brooklyn play, right? How would they act? But I think that with James Harden being there, they don't like him because he left. With Joel Embiid and and um, Claxton getting into it, it brought the arena to ten. Like everybody was on ten. Not only that, they had, from what I heard, is they had a c- couple Jets in the building. They had the Liberty basketball team was there. They had a couple Yankees in the building. So it was just kind of like the place to be in New York last night. So. That was a hostile environment with all that thing mixed up. They're down seven with eight minutes to play, and they end up and came back and and won the game. And every, at that particular point, everything went well. P.J. Tucker, who wasn't in the game, <laughs> comes in and starts mucking things up, grabbing rebounds, right? You know, Maxi is like, you know what? It's time for me to take over. And he did. So to me, that was a game, even though they played poorly, when you add all those things into the mix, that was made this game extra special for the Sixers to get this win. Yeah, and um, I, I too, they should agree with you. They showed some resiliency because I actually thought they were going to lose that game once Brooklyn took control of it in the third quarter. And, and even though they were only up six, it just seemed like they had, um, they had things – a little more under control than the Sixers did. And I was was really wondering how it was going to play out simply because we're talking about a veteran team with the Sixers uh, who have played quite a bit versus this young Nets team that had been put together since February with the trade deadline and the four new players that they have. I wanted to see how the Sixers responded to all of that stuff that was going on. And they eventually did. And it was the young guy who, who, who did it. Now, it was Harris and Tucker, as you mentioned, even DeAnthony Melton, playing some big minutes, especially when James Harden, who we'll get into the next segment, was ejected there in the third quarter. Uh, I wanted to see how they responded, and, and they did. And uh, that, that you, you're right. That was a big win. Uh, before we get to the James Harden piece, I did want to ask you about the Joel Embiid. You said he played terribly offensively, and you're absolutely correct. Uh, but the one part that we talked about with his maturity in general that has been on full display over the course of the year where he's been much better in a lot of different situations that we've seen in the past where we questioned it. Um, He was on the floor a lot, watching it from where I was watching it uh, on television, listening on the Fanatic uh, like I was while the game was ongoing. He was, I thought he was on the floor too much and some of it was uh, created by him. Sure, he got bumped and all that stuff. But it was the falling and trying to get the call or get the referees to notice some things, at least from my vantage point, with some of that. Um, I, I guess I guess I'm asking you, you know, he had a double double. He got double digit boards. He only had 14 points. But I guess I'm asking you, uh, what did you make of his performance? Because sometimes you have to fight through things and the way that they're throwing their defense at him. He's going to have to find different ways to score offensively. But I also felt like at some points, um, not just that first play. Uh, that we talked about between he and Claxton, but some of the mental stuff, I thought he let it, he let it get to him. And he focused on saying that in the end where he said he's <laughs> matured as a player and he has, I thought he took a little bit of a step back with his maturity and some of the things that he did fall into the floor the way that he did trying to get those calls. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the thing is he always falls through the floor, you know what I mean? So it seemed like it was yeah. excessive. Yeah. Oh. Some of them may have seen <laughs> excessive. The one thing that I had a problem with was that kick. Right. I mean, the, the thing is like, I get it. You don't want to get disrespected, mm-hmm. but it was kind of like he lost his cool right there and it was too early. And yeah. And the thing is, he played poorly, and some people may say, hey, they probably would have won. They didn't need him to win. Nah, you need him to win. You need him. Be on the floor. So with that being said, it's kind of like you got to be realized 
that you're too valuable to your team to get ejected. Now, he said that after the game. And I was disappointed but, that he said that because it was like, nah, dude. <laughs> yeah, you wasn't acting that way exactly. at that particular point. And, yeah. and, and, you know, you almost got into it with another guy. You got to realize that that's what their game plan is. That's their best option is to get you. Like, they went after the head of the snake, man. Real rap. They went after the biggest, baddest dude on the team, the best player. And if you make him crumb, if you kill him, knock him out, then the Sixers are done. They knew that. And what they did is they – he allowed that to get the best of them. And the problem with that is all you're doing is putting out game film for everybody else to say, hey, okay. Now we know his skin, it. right. Yeah, let's get under his skin. Yep, absolutely. He's He's got to be better. I, I've praised him through the first two games, even though his numbers haven't been – because I thought he's played pretty well. Um, and, and, and this one, though, I, I thought he let his emotions get the best of him. And he's played in more hostile environments than that. And, and that's why I was a little disappointed in, in what he did. Overall, I thought he was OK, of course, because he stayed in there. He did look like he was a little banged up. His knee buckled on the one uh, there late in the game. And I was I was concerned about that one. But he needs to stay upright in order for them to win. He needs to stay upright. He needs to also have to keep his head in the game. He did with that block shot. So that was. That was pretty good to get that block shot on Spencer Dinwiddie there towards the end of the game, Keith. But uh, in game four, uh, maybe we'll see a much better focused Embiid and then he can talk as much as he wants to talk after the series is done and they sweep this basketball team. So uh, just just my observations on a few things there with Joel Embiid. And um, yeah, that one was it, it was. I, I, I needed I wanted to see better from him in that game. I, I just did. Yeah, I want to see better. And um, he's been he's been really good in this series until I thought he got caught up in some things and allowed himself with a young player, by the way, uh, there in that game. When we come back, we'll get into the James Harden piece because he was ejected late in the third quarter with 13.6 seconds left on the game clock, making a move elbow to the stomach of Royce O'Neal. They deemed it a flagrant two ejection right away, and he was having himself a pretty good game. So you weren't quite sure how that one was going to play out in the end. And as we know, Tyrese Maxey stepped up late. We'll get to him in the third segment. But James Harden, what that meant, was it the right call by the officials? We'll talk about it next right here, Locked On 76ers. You know, I want to talk to you guys about the player of the week. Now, this one was, believe it or not, it was a tough one. Um, you know, I had two players who really played well. I know Joel was moving the ball, doing everything he had. Tobias Harris was playing well. Tyrese Maxey was playing well. But I had to give it, I ended up giving it to Maxey. And I gave it to Maxey because of basically he locked it up for what he did last night, right? Scoring those uh, 25 points, um, you know, scoring 10 of those points, doing one stretch in, in the fourth quarter. And when you, you you think about that, it's also that he had 33 points in games too. So, you know, I he is my Nissan player of the week, and he reminds me of the car, the Aria. Why? Because Maxi is brilliantly fierce. He's fiercely elegant, stunningly powerful, elegantly powerful. He can do it all. Now, the thing about it is the 2023 Nissan Aria packs pin to your seat power and premium intelligence in all one EV. The all new, all electric 2023 Nissan Aria. The EV is for people who love to drive. Shop now at NissanUSA.com. So look, D, I'm telling you, the guy was the guy was balling, and that's why he's the player of the week. Well deserving. Yeah, absolutely well deserving of that. He's had the last two games, tremendous play from third year guard out of Kentucky. And we'll get to him a little bit later as the Nissan Aria player of the week. We thank you for making Locked On 76 as your first listen every day. Those everydayers out there, tomorrow on the show, hey, we'll get you ready for the uh, Brooklyn Nets game at game four at Sixers Nets, uh, potential close out there for the 76ers in the sweep in the first round matchup. All right, Keith, James Harden exited the game. He had over 20 points. He played pretty well offensively in terms of finding a shot uh, opposed to what he had with just single digits finishing in game number two, despite the fact that they got the win. 
much better performance in this one, uh, Keith, as he was able to pick up the pick up the solid game in general. So I got to ask you, man. I mean, the play that happened again, 13.6 seconds left in the game clock, third quarter, driving on Royce O'Neal, making the move, and typically what he does, and sometimes he gets away with it, sometimes he doesn't. They'll, you know, they have that little shove to create a little bit more space as he extends his left arm out uh, to get the shot off as he was driving right. Royce O'Neal took a punch to the gut and he crumbled to the floor. You were there from the television view. It looked like it was just a, you know, a tap in the stomach, a simple push. If they wanted to call an offensive foul, call an offensive foul. If you wanted to even give them a technical or flagrant one, do that. Even though I don't think it was that excessive, but if they want to do something, okay, fine, go ahead and do that. But an ejection, Keith, I just didn't see that as an ejection uh, for James Harden in that spot. I don't know. Uh, you know, it's it's one of those things. They kept playing it over and over again. And, you know, you can say the gut, maybe it's the gut. It looked like it could have been lower than the gut, right? But it actually, I, didn't. to me, it didn't even look like that. I, was I like, mean, I, they kept playing. Well, but you got to realize in the in the arenas, they keep showing angles that to get people like, oh, oh. Right? Of course, yeah. But, but, um, but I, I honestly, I felt like when you, when you think about everything that transpired on that night, um, I, I kind of felt like, especially with uh, MB uh, staying in the game, I felt like they had no choice but to do it because he hit them. And the reason being is because if you notice, and I know people are saying they don't care and it's not the conspiracy theories and all this BS and that, but there was a lot of people when MB stayed in the game who were saying, look at it. I told you the NBA likes the stars. They want the Sixers to play Boston. Embiid, how is Embiid staying in this game when he kicked the guy in the groin area, right? By so, the way, I didn't think Embiid should have been ejected either. You don't think he should have? No, nah, flagrant, flagrant one. That was enough. I thought so, yeah. You know, it could have been a flagrant too, but the thing is he missed them, and that's what the guy said. He said the reason why Harden was ejected is because he connected. You're talking about Tony Brothers, the lead. Yeah, Tony Brothers. Yeah, the lead, the um, the crew chief. The reason why MB didn't get ejected is because he missed it, right? So my thing is, it got to a point where (laughs) it just looked (laughs) like if if that's what you're going by, if that's what you're going by, then Harden had to go. Even though Harden took exception to it, a lot of people did. Um, I don't know, man. It just seemed like, I, I, you know, Brooklyn was upset. People were upset. And I think that if Harden would have stayed in the game after that, even like now, I'm talking about nationally in the league, the league would have probably been doing some damage control on how come you protected their two stars. You know what I mean? I mean, I know that might sound crazy to you, but I honestly think that has something to do with it. Yeah, see, I think I think with the history of what his move is, and sure, you know, he'll he'll hook sometimes. He'll have a hook and try to get a draw foul. He'll hook his arm underneath to defend his arm uh, or something like that. And as I mentioned with that play, normally you'll see him in there are times where he extends his arm to create that space. Offensive foul. I thought that's exactly what he did. I think if there was anything, there was incidental contact to – to if it was in the lower regions, if that's what, you know, like you said, it kept playing it and it was trying to make it seem like that that's exactly what he did. For me, it didn't even look like that's what he did. It looked like he got him in his gut. And and it was more of the the forearm of like a punch than anything in the in the in the lower regions where I, I think a lot of people have been talking about. And I, I didn't see it that way. And they did, they had the uh the 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 ability to go back and look at it in multiple different angles. And of course, going back to, to the uh, replay center in New Jersey and do all of that stuff. But even when they do that, sometimes Keith, I don't agree with the final result, whether it's a team that I'm vested in or not playing. And just as a basketball fan, I'm like, how did they miss that one? When uh, we all clearly saw this. So I didn't think James Harden should have been ejected uh, from that, from that perspective on that particular play, because it's something he does 
all the time. So if that's the case, then he should be ejected all the time because he pushes off occasionally with getting that arm extended into the body of the defender. And I just thought that was a bad call. And um, as far as the MB part goes, where they said he, he didn't connect, I didn't think Embiid was trying to kick him in the lower regions. I thought he was trying to kick him to get him off of him. It just so happened that he's standing over him. So where's his leg gonna go? His leg is gonna know, go dude, there. You don't do that. You don't do that, dude. I didn't say you don't do that. Yeah, I you don't. I mean, like you don't you, like like the thing is that's kind of saying like you know. I totally I, I disagree. Fired I totally and that's disagree. like saying. I mean, I get it, it's different, but it's different. But it's kind of like I pulled out my gun and fired it. But I ain't mean to hit the guy. I just wanted him to get off my porch. I didn't you know say he mean? didn't mean to hit him. I said yeah. he meant to hit him. That's why he deserved a flagrant one. I said he wasn't trying to kick him there. He was just trying to kick him. Wherever he landed, he was going to land. He. I didn't think he was intentionally trying to kick him. And that's why he deserved a flagrant one, because he shouldn't have kicked him, period. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's know. just me. I mean, look, man, you've played, you've had people, you play football, you have people standing over you and all kinds of stuff. And you try, yeah, you're trying to kick them. Are you trying to kick them there all the time? No, you just simply like get off of me or get away from me. No, nah, this is like what that. happened. This is what happened when I played and most people played like and probably when you play basketball. So somebody would do that. And then next thing you know, the ref would see it. That person would get a penalty in football. Mm-hmm. Or that person would um, would get a, a, a tech or something like that in basketball. And then maybe not the next play, but a couple plays later, you take the person out or something happens. Mm-hmm. It might even be waiting until later into the game. It's like, I'm going to get them back. That's what happens. You tend to don't try not to react mm-hmm. right then and there. You know what I mean? You just don't. You know, yeah, And then a lot of times. talked about the immaturity part. And a lot of times, if you are the superstar player, what happens is you don't do it. Somebody else does it for you. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. My my whole thing was, I just did, again, we just railed on him for the first segment about him not being smart enough to play, you know, just let that go. He stepped over you. Push him. You know what I mean? Whatever you got to do, don't kick him. And that's why he deserved the flagrant one that was assessed to him. I am just saying that I didn't think he was trying to kick him there. He was just going to kick him wherever the kick landed. He, it wasn't like, here's my target. Let me get here. Bang. Let me knock him out here in, in the lower region and, and do that. So that is just my, my my thoughts, you know, and how, how I saw it. But, hey, either way, both of their star players uh, involved in a, a critical play in the game. And they were able to survive it overall and still pull away with the victory in that one. And a big part of that in the end, in the final three minutes, 10 points in a row, 10 of their last 13. That's Tyrese Maxey as he finished with the team high 25. We'll talk about him and why he was so important, why he's able to be on the roll now in these last two games after just 13 points in game one. We'll do all that next right here, final segment in Locked On 76s. But I also have to tell you about my good friends there. Uh, at, at an eBay and uh, eBay Motors because I mean, if you're dealing with car situations and look right now you're in spring and you want to make sure your car is clean, sounding good, uh, riding right as you have your windows rolled down, you see people looking at you staring, you want to make sure your car is right. And for a championship team, the same thing. It's about looking right. And it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage, and look for the green check to know the part will in fact fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors and with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are in fact guaranteed like in any sport. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. Eligibility, items only. Eligible, items only. Exclusions apply. All right, welcome back. Keith Pompey, Devon Gibbons. This is Locked On 76ers. After a Sixers win in game number three, they take a commanding 3-0 lead 
in the series over the Brooklyn Nets. And a big piece of that, Keith, was, in fact, their year guard. Second game in a row, Tyrese Maxey coming through in the clutch for them. He finished with 25 points, 10 points there, Keith. In the final three minutes of the game, he scored 10 in a row. He had another free throw from P.J. Tucker, which made it 11. And uh, De'Anthony Melton with that steal at the end and get the dunk 13. So 10 of their last 13, 10 in a row from three-point range. Some runners there in the painted area getting a layup as well. Tyrese Maxey only had one field goal attempt after playing really well. 15 points there in the first half. He only had one field goal attempt, Keith, in the third quarter. And then in that final three minutes, especially with James Harden out, he had to play a lot of point guard where he was really trying to get the ball to Embiid and get everybody else going and wasn't as aggressive, wasn't attacking until that final three minutes. Layup, three-pointer, another three-pointer, and another two-pointer. Uh, he was fantastic down the stretch. Yeah, he was. He was. I mean, you know, this was a, a big game for him. You know, the one thing that I really liked, and, I, you know, we touched about it a little bit, before him but when it came to maxi i remember in the beginning of the season the sixers it was probably the third game of the season or fourth i don't know it was it was um i don't know but it was early on when they played the toronto raptors right and afterwards doc was telling me that maxi has to realize when to take over like he can't always defer to joel and james and that's what happened. He took over. He knew the moment was his, and he took over. So that's a lot of – we talk about Joel's maturation as a player. That was a maturation that, that we saw with Maxi because he took over the game man, and won that. And if he didn't do that – I mean, because he was hot. If he didn't step up – people forget, that was his first two points, that first basket and that fourth. That was his first two points of the second half. So if he didn't, like, say, okay, I got to defer, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, they would have been in trouble. And, um, you know, I really like what I saw from Tyrese. Nah, he was he was good, yeah. Uh, one field goal attempt in the third quarter, did not make it. And then in that final 10, that final three minutes where he scored the 10 points, those were his only shots in the fourth where he was able to get some good looks and, and, and get those going. And, and he did just that. He was – he was really good. He was in attack mode. Uh, the the, the three-pointer to break the tie from 96-96. It was an ATO situation. Doc Rivers gave him the opportunity, and uh, he stepped back on Dinwiddie and drilled that shot, and that was a big shot for the Sixers to give them that three-point cushion because on the next play, I think it was the very next play, is when P.J. Tucker uh, fouled Spencer Dinwiddie. They called that a foul. Questionable uh, in, in that one, but they called it, and Spencer Dinwiddie – Went to the free throw line. I think he made um, two, you know, one. Yeah, two of the three uh, on, on the particular um, – uh, to cut it to one. And then the Sixers came back down and were able to do what they needed to do there, there down the stretch. And uh, that was a tough one, man. But he played really, really well. And that's why he, again, was your player of the week with the two games that he had back-to-back, -back, 33 and 25, to lead the Sixers in scoring. Uh, very, very, very – very good performance, a good time for him to step up, good time for him to show that when they needed it most in that moment. Uh, for the Nets, three players in double figures. Again, Mikael led all scores with 26. Uh, then when he finally got 20 points in the series where he was able to get 20 uh, on the books and Cam Johnson had 17. Kale came out, scored seven in a row in the third quarter where they started to come back and they cut that lead to four. Then later in the third is when Cam Johnson got hot and he was able to really hit some some key baskets. They continue to struggle, though, Keith, with some of their rotational guys, uh, their, their reserve guys, their role players. Royce O'Neal still can't hit a shot. Seth Curry didn't even play. Uh, Jock Vaughn had to call the number of Cam Thomas, man. The, Joe Harris couldn't hit any shots. They tried everything, and they just don't. They just they just couldn't do it. They couldn't hit enough shots outside of those three players. Nah, they couldn't. It was uh, that was that was kind of um, it's sad. I mean, but you know what? I shouldn't say sad. I mean, this is a young team. Jock Vaughn came up with a stat before the game, um, saying how. This is the only team in the NBA in the NBA playoffs does, that does not have a current all-star or a past all-star on their team. 
a la like James Harden was an all-star before this season, you know, whereas uh, Darius Garland for Cleveland was an all-star before this season. Um, they're the only team in the playoffs that doesn't have that. This is a young squad. And, and you look at it and, you know, they just don't have the firepower to beat the 76ers. Like everything, a lot of stuff has to go right for them. And I think this was a lot of why we saw the desperation, how they tried to go after the head of the snake, tried to get intimidate them, because this is their best chance to win. They just don't have it. And he also pointed out something else, that they asked dribble penetration, shot creators, and stuff like that. And he said, I'm just going to be simple. We just don't have our roster. On our roster, they don't have those type of players anymore. You know, they got a, a good player. Um, you know, a, a budding all-star, future all-star, Mikel Bridges, but they don't have a point guard right now that can set Mikel up in, in great spots. You know what I mean? They just don't have it. They don't have one that can kick the ball out to the shooters. They have a bunch of shooters, but they just don't have a guy who can penetrate and kick it out, a quality point guard right now. And Spencer Dinwiddie, I'm not criticizing him, because he's the best guy that they have for that role, but that's not his role. So, you know, it's it's just they're doing what they're doing. And, and to them, it's like you look at it, they had a crazy season. Talk about Ben Simmons' situation. You talk about Kyrie and, and KD leaving. And you look at it like, hey, you know what? We went and we made it to the playoffs. You guys are, are bonding, gelling a little bit. And we got a lot of work to do this offseason. We're going to bring in some players to fit around you guys. So, but right now, they just don't have it, man. They just don't have enough to beat the 76ers. And you also mentioned Ben Simmons being there. Um, I didn't see him here at all. Was he just there rehabbing and that's why he didn't make the trip? Or did he make the trip and we just didn't know about it? Yeah, he didn't make the trip. He didn't make okay. the trip. Yeah. All right. Well, um, 3-0. Uh, we'll see what happens in game number four, Saturday afternoon, one o'clock in Barclays. Keith is there. He'll be on the ground as uh, things go down for the Sixers and the Nets. We thank everybody for making Locked On 76 as your first listen every day. Every day is again, as always, we appreciate you. And tomorrow on the show, try to squeeze one in before uh, game four or after game four. However, we are able to do so schedule wise. We'll see what we can do. Keith, you mind letting the good folks know where they can find us otherwise? Yeah, you can find us wherever you get your podcast at. Um, um, it's free and available, just like the other one that D just hyped up. But when you go, when you go to our YouTube channel, make sure you click on the Liberty Bell, right? And you click on the Liberty Bell and you become a new subscriber. You also, in addition to that, you will also... Um, uh, get uh, notifications on when we do our podcast. But tonight, you got to do yourself a favor and you got to listen to my man D from 6 p.m. Um, to 10 p.m. on the Divine Given Show on 97.5 FM, Philadelphia. Now, also, you guys, you can go on the internet, you go anywhere and you do 97.5 FM and you can get this radio radio show. It's a good listen. But make sure you follow my man on Twitter, right? At DivineG975. Again, DivineG975. You can follow me on Twitter at Pompey on Sixers, right? You can also um, you could you can follow me on Pompey on Sixers, and you can read my articles in the Philadelphia Inquirer. Thank you. All right, man. Appreciate it. Make sure you guys go read Keith again. He's there. So he has a lot of insight on what's going on there with the Sixers and the Nets. And make sure you follow him for a lot of the articles that he reposts there on Twitter at Pompeii on Sixers, of course, inquire.com to find his work. Keith, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thanks to everybody out there for listening and watching. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Thanks. Peace.